Okay, good morning. My name is Ulrike Kraus. I'm the program manager for climate change for the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. Now, why does that not advance? There we go. Okay, you think now we're on schedule? So the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund is 10 years old and it is an umbrella environmental fund with a flexible structure to implement innovative solutions for resource mobilization in the Caribbean through a range of financial instruments. And together we manage about all the instruments, 156 million US dollars and the CBF together with a group of national conservation trust funds forms the Caribbean sustainable finance architecture. So we have three instruments really. The first program is the conservation finance program. That's the oldest. And it has an endowment fund that was principally started by the German Development Bank, KFW, with um, <clears throat> over 80 million US dollars. The market value now is um, 88, despite the poor investment climate. And we also have a number of projects. They came in recently and they are just over 10 million US dollars. So um, though the conservation finance program supports a number of countries that are interested in setting up national conservation trust funds. So it depends a lot on the country's needs and them approaching us for assistance of getting that sorted to um, establish their own conservation finance. And you see the flags down there, the countries we're working with presently. Cuba, we don't have an agreement yet. It is a bit more complicated and quite different to the other countries, but we're on a good road towards it. Then um, I am in charge of the climate change program. Our only instrument is the ecosystem-based adaptation facility at this moment. It is a sinking fund of 50 million US dollars, and we award grants to countries in the well, Caribbean countries who are on the um, OECD list of development aid. So you see some brackets around some of them. For example, Antigua and Barbuda was on it when we started our first call for proposal, but now they slipped off that list and they can still be part of regional project as part of the transition. So the countries you see in that bottom row in the square brackets, they can only be part of regional projects because they're in a tradition, transitional phase and the others can be beneficiaries. Cuba joined for a second call for proposal and Montserrat is the only non-independent country that is eligible, but we don't have a project with them yet. They were only added to the list when we started our third call for proposal. And just last year, we started a nature-based economies program that will focus on circular economy recycling with 25.5 million US dollars, also as a sinking fund. I think we've just advertised the project coordinator, so that is just starting. So first to our conservation finance program, there's still a need to expand our support to the different countries. So one of our success indicators is new territories that we can add. The amount is dispersed to NCTF's National Conservation Trust Funds and the number of NCTFs that reach payment three. At that point, they require too much funding. So we give them some pre-finance to get their whole organization set up. Then the second, under the partnership agreement, they can then start giving grants to eligible worthwhile projects. And on the third payment, they have to start looking for their own funding to gradually wean themselves a little bit of CBF funding. And um, yeah, we also have a lot of regional events. So that number is a success indicator. So far, they've dispersed 7 million US dollars, all from the interest, from the revenue from the endowment fund. And um, there are matching funds already coming in. And that number will increase currently $3.2 million. So just to give you an idea, the blue is the total disbursements, red is pre-financing, and um, the partnership agreement is the green. So the blue is really the cumulative and it grew over the years as our members grew. 
But then in 2021, we had a couple of serious hurricanes. And um, I mentioned the flexible structure that we have. And our donors, we are very grateful that they allow us this flexibility. And we were allowed to give out um, relief grants very unbureaucratically. Gran Bahama, Dominica, they benefited from that because they were completely devastated and could quickly set up nurseries, replant, etc. So the other program, climate change, the ecosystem-based adaptation facility, as I mentioned, the sinking fund, and we focus on um, EBA projects as the sustainably managed coastal and marine habitats. And you need those three axes that form EBA. There's the biocon biodiversity conservation aspect, climate change adaptation, and the socioeconomic. So it can include rehabilitation, protection, but it always uses ecosystems and their services to allow people and communities to adapt to climate change. So there is a livelihood component. Currently, we have 18 active projects. Six projects have been completed under the first call for proposal, and um, we have another three projects that are approved, but we are still negotiating the grant agreement. We are working in um, 11 countries. Eight of them are the primary beneficiaries that were shown earlier. As I said, Montserrat is still missing from that list because they only became eligible recently. And um, three of the secondary countries as part of regional initiatives. And um, again, we are very, very blessed with our flexibility from the donor side. We can finance NGOs government organization, even private sector, which is really exceptional, and international academic institutions. So it all depends if the beneficiaries, if it trickles down to the people to adapt to climate change, then we are allowed to fund it in those territories. We have completed three calls for proposals. So far we committed almost 28 million US dollars and have dispersed just over half of that, 15 million. And we are currently evaluating a fourth call for proposal so the um, shortlisted applicants have been notified and are now preparing their full proposal. It is a two-stage process. And um, we are able to fund up to 14 million, depending on the quality of the submissions that we get. So what kind of projects are we funding? Mostly protection, restoration of coastal and marine ecosystems. and. The ecosystems are proposed by the applicant. So it is really the needs they have, they tell us. And it, if it makes sense and fulfills what Jessica said um, in terms of proposal writing, and it's not an obviously recycled proposal that completely bypasses the EBA, it has to be EBA, which is not always the case. So mangroves is by far the top. Almost every project has a mangrove component in it. Some are completely mangrove, others have some mangrove, followed by coral reefs. We do a lot of coral reef restoration. Seagrass beds, salt marshes, and coastal forests are in there, but relatively marginal. So I'm extremely excited to learn more about seagrasses here because it is something that we have not really worked in very much, only in the Dominican Republic, a little bit in St. Lucia. As I said, the project's always part of a broader climate change adaptation strategy. So I'm very interested also in this four because we try to link up more with government. Most of our beneficiaries are NGOs, but we need something sustainable after the projects end. And um, yeah, the livelihood opportunities, of course, have to be sustainable. And they are the priorities for our beneficiaries so far, sustainable fisheries, CMOS farming, and ecotourism. And... Um, <clears throat> We also had a workshop and we coordinated already with Sabine before, and she was actually presenting there on mangrove and coral reef restoration, but I'm only talking about the mangrove one here today. We had that in February this year and brought together our grantees from both programs and a lot of partners. We had 40 persons in person attending the workshop in Punta Cana and over 100 that um, joined us online. We had um, a peer-to-peer -peer learning from our grantees, especially first cohort of um, beneficiaries, Katya. They're based here in Costa Rica, of course, but the project was in the Dominican Republic, as was IDI, JPHO in Haiti, 
and Redham also in the Dominican Republic, and then partner organizations, uh, French word that I will not pronounce, Marfund, they shared the manual with us, Smithsonian Institution and the TRM. So the main takeaway messages I want to share with you in restoration was the need to address the drivers of degradation as a first step. We will not fund any project where you just tell us we want to replant mangroves or replant corals or seagrass or whatever. If you don't know what causes the de degradation in the first place, that is a waste of money. So you have to know the degradation driver and address it. And once that is the case, we can think about planting, but very often, especially with the mangroves, they recover very well by themselves. That's what we call passive restoration, as soon as the conditions are restored to where they should be. The other take home message that uh, cuts across all countries and projects is the broad stakeholder involvement. And that has to start at the early planning stages and carry all the way through implementation and into an exit strategy to have a sustainable program afterwards when the three-year project ends. And that is very much needed to manage the different interests because very often charcoal is used for, uh, mangroves are used for charcoal in Haiti. And unless you manage those interest groups, they're not always the local residents. They can be outsiders who come in. So um, it can only be successful if you include all these stakeholders, even the ones you might not think about. So it is worth mapping them out early and be open to somebody come in you didn't have on your radar, as we didn't have on the radar some of the outside communities who come in. The local communities know the importance of the mangroves for their fishing, but outsiders came in. Luckily, with the fuel shortage, they couldn't mobilize in Haiti. So the crisis was to our advantage. But um, yeah, it's interesting dynamics. And um, yeah, we found a lot of shared themes with community mobilization, the financial mechanisms, mangrove value chains, especially for the livelihoods. I had prepared a couple of case studies, but then the, I was told I only had 10 minutes. So uh, we have some value chains around honey and um, another one around recycling because the main problem was actually um, solid waste in Jamaica. So if we have time in the discussions, I can go into those a little more. And again, the buy-in from all stakeholders, including government, because we need them after project ends to um, have some sustainability. So thank you very much. And I understand questions are at the end.